Hey everyone, I'm Shaylin here with Reedsy. So today we're going to be looking at the Save the Cat plot structure. This is also known as the 15 beat plot structure or the Blake Snyder beat sheet. This is a plot structure that was designed for film by Blake Snyder, hence the name. Um, and it's very popular in the film world, but the fiction and novel writing community has really taken a shine to this plot structure because even though it was first designed for film, it applies very nicely to a lot of novels. This is a plot structure I personally really like. It's one that makes a lot of sense to me. Even though I'm not really someone to actually use plot structures when I'm writing my novels, this has always been one of my favorite because to me it's just very intuitive. The beats and how they fit together make a lot of sense. So for today's video, we're actually going to be breaking down the structure by developing a plot for it together. If you are longtime viewers of this channel, you might remember this same video from many years ago. We're just redoing it, making it a little better. If you never saw that video and you're new here, basically I'm just going to be using a random plot generator, taking a concept and turning it into a book using the Save the Cat structure so you guys can see what the beats look like in application. The really nice thing about this structure in my experience is that it's the perfect balance between detail and flexible. It's flexible enough that you can apply it to a lot of stories and if you need to make some changes, it's really easy to, like if you need to change the order of things or skip a beat, it's really easy to. But it's also specific enough that it gives you really specific events to help guide you to create a story. So for that reason, it's actually possible to just sit down and plot out a whole story with this beat sheet if you're familiar with the beats. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Welcome to the actual part of the video where we're going to develop a plot together. So the nice thing about Save the Cat is that it has very specific plot beats. So once you understand those very specific plot beats, it's pretty easy to pull together a plot literally on the fly. You know, there are some where the plot beats are a bit broader, more vague. Like we did a video recently on the Fictian Curve, which is a plot structure I love and it seemed really intuitive to me, but it would be hard to sit down and just bang out a Fictian Curve plot line because it doesn't necessarily have distinct plot points. Save the Cat, however, has very distinct plot points. So once you're familiar with them, and especially once you start looking for them in movies or books or whatever, you become familiar with what they look like. So today we're gonna to be developing a plot together. I'm doing this all on the fly. Um, I'm just gonna do this in the Reedsy book editor and I'm also going to generate our plot. So we have a plot generator, which is pretty fun. So let's use that. Okay, so we have for our plot, um, a janitor who is a compulsive liar as our protagonist and a secretary who has burnt every bridge. For the plot, it says it's a satire about the American dream. It kicks off on the sixth train in East Harlem with the beginning of a relationship. Note that someone in the story has a criminal background that will come to light. Okay, I don't know if I'm necessarily gonna integrate all of that because that is quite a lot to consider. We're gonna work with the two characters, a janitor who is a compulsive liar, a secretary who has burnt every bridge. We'll start it on a train with them meeting with the beginning of their relationship and we'll know that someone and someone in the story has a criminal background that will come to light. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna write out the beats. Let's start with our opening image. We're gonna build this as we go, so there might be some reshuffling around. Obviously, if you were using this for your story, you would probably give it some thought in advance. I didn't do that. So let's just name our characters really quick. Um, the secretary, I'm gonna name her Kelly, and the janitor's name is gonna be Olivia. I'm gonna write that under notes here just so we can kind of keep track. This structure was developed for screen and on screen it's all about image, right? But we can apply the same thing to a novel. Um, obviously it just works a little different because on the screen you literally have an opening image whereas a novel might start on narrative, it might start on uh, it might start on a variety of things. Well it's gonna be a train so we're gonna maybe start with Olivia boarding the train. Maybe she is fleeing from something. Uh, she's a compulsive liar, so we'll say trying not to be seen and skittishly takes a seat in an empty car. She sits on the train alone for a bit, maybe slowly feeling relief. She realizes she's gotten away with her crime, whatever it is. If you look up the Save the Cat structure, it always puts theme stated as the second beat. 
However, theme stated and setup actually kind of happen concurrently. So the way Save the Cat works is some beats are just a single event. So opening image is just the opening image. Some are longer periods of time and the setup is a longer period of time, whereas the theme stated is a single moment that happens and it happens within the setup. So I, I think it makes no sense. I think that setup should be two and theme stated should be three. Two happens during three. I don't know why it's ordered that way, it's strange to me. So we're actually gonna look at the setup first and then we'll think about the theme stated. So what is the setup? The setup is basically the period of the story that is basically our introductory beat. Okay, so we know that Olivia meets. Mm, maybe we shouldn't start it directly on, maybe we should start with her stealing something. Let's make this a heist, okay? I'm, I'm getting a heist vibe from this, so we're gonna make this a heist. So Kelly and Olivia are gonna meet on this train and maybe they're both fleeing their various crime scenes and they connect and they realize that together they could pull an incredible heist. Can all of that happen on the train? If this was a, normally the setup would be a bit longer, but maybe the, the whole setup could kind of happen on the train. So I'm wondering if maybe this could be part of the setup. And what we're actually gonna do is begin with an opening image of Olivia stealing something. So Olivia's a janitor, right? Olivia, a janitor, is cleaning a fancy building, a museum, maybe. She takes careful note of where the security cameras are, the fire escapes. So maybe she's not gonna steal something right then and there. She's planning her heist, her art heist. And then maybe, oh, we can see, you know, the piece de resistance, one might say. Um, she studies, let's just say it's a, let's just say it's a Fabergé egg, gold, and sitting in a glass case. This is the prize. She's gonna try to steal this Fabergé egg. I don't know, that's the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of what's something really fancy. So then she's gonna board the train in the setup. Then Kelly is gonna get on board. I don't know, how are they recognizing that each other are criminals? <laughs> Maybe we could see Kelly like pickpocket someone and Olivia could keep her secret. Two of them now. I'm getting a little too detailed with this. Rather than breaking this up beat by beat by beat, let's just say they end up realizing they have a shared criminal history, their specific involvement in the museum, and we'll say that Kelly is a secretary, could help them pull off theft of the gold Fabergé egg. So now we need to think about our theme stated. We're gonna go back and look at the theme stated. Normally your setup would probably be a little bit longer. Actually, now that I think about it, this would be the catalyst. So the catalyst is the inciting incident, right? So them deciding to steal it would be the inciting incident because that's when they realize, hey, we could steal this, make a bunch of money. That's like the first step in the chain of events. Now that that has happened, they've made that decision, they have a goal, the plot will continue to unfold. So we need to go back and think of a theme stated. So this is gonna go back to the, the worldview probably of Olivia, because Kelly is our side character, Olivia is our main character, which means Olivia's is the one whose worldview we're gonna be unpacking. Um, which means she needs to have some kind of worldview that needs to be challenged or unraveled, probably by Kelly. So this is interesting because they're both sketchy <laughs> criminals, but I love that for them. So let's think about what our theme stated could be. It's hard because I don't know what the theme is. Let's think, did our budget narrator give us a theme? Oh, if there's a twist, the, child is, the story is told from the perspective of a child who doesn't fully comprehend what's happening. Well, we're not gonna end up doing that because it's too late. Um, doesn't, give, doesn't tell us what our theme is. Oh, it's supposed to be about the American dream. Can I work with that? I'm gonna actually move the theme stated to after the setup because it makes no sense for it to be before. We're gonna say that Kelly 
and Olivia agree that see the thing about the theme stated normally it's a character telling the main character that they're wrong normally the theme stated isn't two characters agreeing normally the theme stated happens when a side character will say to the main character why do you always do this or you think this they should go for it this is not a very good theme because I don't really know what the theme is. We'll come back to this. Maybe a theme will emerge as we continue developing it. So in my seemingly infinite wisdom, turns out I actually forgot a stage when I was recording this. So we're just going to go add that now. The stage that I forgot is the debate. So this is um, the last stage of act one. In the catalyst, you have a call to action, right? An opportunity that comes up. Um, that translates to the goal of the story. But after the catalyst, you have the debate. This is where the main character has to actually decide if they're gonna go through with the call to action. I think we had, you know, the catalyst being they realize that they have the capabilities to try and steal this egg, and so they're gonna go try and steal this egg together. But because we have the debate, we actually need a period of time where they're contemplating whether they wanna go through with this. So I think this would be a great place to raise the stakes. Olivia, contemplates whether it's worth it to risk everything. Can maybe see her having some financial problems, so she really does need the money. This raises the stakes. Maybe she can't pay rent and is close to being evicted. So then in the break into two, that's when the character will actually decide Actually, yes, I do want to go through with this opportunity. That will kind of mark the end of the first act. Act two is like the middle, right? So it's where we're basically going to see the development of the plot, escalating stakes, escalating obstacles, all that fun stuff. So the break into two is a bit of a self-explanatory beat. Like a lot of them kind of the names tell you what they are, but it's going to be the event that breaks us into act two. So the catalyst was them deciding that they were going to steal it. Um, now what we basically need is an event that's probably a follow-up to the catalyst that's going to begin the escalation of the stakes. I'm just copying the plot of Ocean's 8 at this point. They realize that there's like, f there's an opportunity for them to steal it. Learns of an event happening museum that will give them an opportunity. To steal it. So now we need the B story. So B story, to me this has always been a bit of a confusingly named plot point because you would think that it means backstory, right? You would hear B story and think it means backstory, but it actually means basically subplot. So in a novel you'd probably have multiple subplots. You might have a C story, a D story, etc. In a movie there's usually just one main one and it's usually a relationship development. Now this is kind of tricky because we already have character who's in our A-plot that we have like a relationship development with, and that's Kelly. So maybe we should introduce another character, a side character. Let's say Olivia's brother. Olivia's brother comes to town. We want to see Olivia's compulsive lying happen. They meet up. Olivia lies about her life and makes it seem quite grandiose and like, she's very successful. He might eventually end up kind of being on to her and what she's up to with the heist. Um, because he kind of knows her deal. Okay, so now we have fun and games. Fun and games is also sometimes known as the promise of the premise. I'll write it here too. So when you hear a log line or when you hear a read the back jacket there's a central premise to a story this is where we see it play out so in this case the promise of the premise is that there's going to be a heist between these two kind of sketchily minded women um and they're going to try and steal a faberge egg so this is where we're basically going to see them actively doing it so this is where kelly and olivia hatch their plan. I don't really know how one would steal a Fabergé egg, so I'm not gonna try to figure that out right now. But this is where they plan out their their plan, basically. This is a longer beat. Fun and Games is usually the longest beat in the story. This in a novel would probably be several chapters. 
at least several scenes because it's like the main bulk of the story. It's not just one thing that happens. However, the next thing, the midpoint, is just one thing that happens. And it's basically a turning point. So usually the midpoint is either a moment of false hope or false defeat. We're gonna make the midpoint them actually going in for the heist and maybe they think they've succeeded. Uh, okay, actually here, they go in for the heist. We're actually gonna see the heist happen also in Promised of the Premise. And then the midpoint is gonna be they get the egg. So that's gonna be a moment of false hope. So now for the bad guys close in, this is basically where we have a moment of highly escalating tension. So in this case, I'm gonna make the antagonist the brother. I think the brother probably wants the best for Olivia, but also like doesn't want her to go to jail because she stole a Fabergé egg. Greg, first name that came to mind, just so it's easy to keep track of the characters. Greg finds the Fabergé egg. He confronts her about it, but she lies and says it's just a fake she found at a yard sale. She wants to fix it up and see if she can sell it for more money. He's not buying it. So all is lost. So this is going to be where it seems like they have failed. Maybe the brother takes the egg from her and is going to go return it. Has stolen. Oh, we'll also add to fun and games that Kelly and Olivia really bond here. Neither of them have other close relationships. And this is the first friendship that's meant something to either of them in a long time. I think what we want to develop here is that the stake is not actually losing the egg. The stake is actually losing their friendship. Um, okay, so maybe the theme is actually about friendship. That's what goes in the theme stated. They're both loners and they agree that's for the best and it's why they'll make a good team. So that could be our theme stated. And that's what's gonna be upended when the friendship is actually what's most important. So all is lost. Olivia's found another brother stolen the egg when she tells Kelly, Kelly is furious because it's Olivia's letting her brother find out. And Olivia has now lost both her only friend, her brother, and the egg. So now it's the dark night of the soul. They have nothing left and they have to sit with that. Olivia is alone. She has to reflect on what's more important, getting the egg back or getting Kelly back. So I think she's gonna end, realize that she wants to get Kelly back. So The Dark Knight of the Soul, if you have watched a lot of movies, you're probably very familiar with this beat. Think about movies you've watched that are maybe like action movies or have like an ensemble cast where there's like kind of a main group of characters. And you know how in a lot of movies, something will happen that kind of destroys their plan and it seems like the characters have no chance anymore. That would be all is lost. Then, you know how there's often a scene where all the characters will reconvene, everyone will be sitting in a room and someone will say, it's over and someone will say it's not over and they'll have a bit of an argument but then they'll realize that if they kind of settle their differences and hatch a new plan then they can still go after their goal that's the dark knight of the soul beat in this case we don't have a bunch of characters we just have the two main characters so olivia is going to face the dark knight of the of the soul alone she's going to have to reflect alone it would be great to see her like on a train, call back to the beginning. Olivia goes to Kelly to apologize. We'll say they work it out, work it out and make a plan to get the egg back from her brother before he can return it to the museum. So then in the finale, they're gonna do another little mini heist, which is stealing the egg back from the brother. I don't know what the message here is, they don't learn their lesson and st still end up stealing. But 
This is just a fun movie where we want to see heists happen and be successful, not contemplate morally rather stealing is wrong. So they're gonna steal again. They go in for heist number two. We can say they replace the egg with a fake one that they make. When Greg returns the fake egg and is told it's a fake, he believes um, Olivia was actually telling the truth. So she really does get away with her criminality, as does Kelly in this movie, but they have the power of friendship. And then we're just gonna say that they take the money from selling the egg and we see them on the beach enjoying their riches. Best friends for life. Morally, this movie is very uh, morally bankrupt, but in terms of fun heists happening, um, I think it's great. So the finale is what would typically be referred to as the climax. For some reason in the Blake Snyder beat sheet, there are a lot of familiar plot beats that are just renamed, like the inciting incident is renamed the catalyst. The finale is the climax of the book. So it's where the tension is the highest. Here we had the main heist actually happen at the midpoint. Um, and then we had fallout and then we have like a secondary heist. They're still going after the same goal they've had since the beginning, which is to get this egg. It's just in a context they didn't expect because there's been obstacles along the way. And there's the added stake of their friendship. So that's what we want. The stakes have actually risen. The stakes at the beginning where we want to get this Fabergé egg so we can have a bunch of money. The stakes at the end now are actually we're friends and we want to go be able to have friendship shenanigans and have a bunch of money. <laughs> the stakes now have risen to include their friendship. So in a movie, the final image is often something that wants to call back to the opening image. This is not a rule, it's just something you'll see in a lot of screenwriting advice. In this case, I don't think it needs to call back to the opening image. Um, I think that the, it's just gonna end with them on the beach and I feel happy with that. So that's our plot. Um, obviously, this is not the most perfect storyline ever because I just made it up out of nowhere. But I hope that it shows what the different beats look like and also shows that once you're familiar with the beats, it's really, really easy to pull together a plot line. The best way to learn what the beats look like and kind of how to identify them is to try and identify them in movies. They're easier to spot in movies because in a novel, there's way more than 15 beats usually. Movies have way less scenes, way fewer things that happen. There's not going to be as much extra content kind of disguising the beat. So if you want to learn this, movies are the place to look, especially because movies do tend to be based on Save the Cat. Novels can be based on Save the Cat, but it's not like an industry standard for novels to all follow, follow Save the Cat. It's much more common in screens. I will leave some more resources on plot structures in the description. We've got a bunch of videos on various plot structures that you can check out. Um, it's a pretty fun topic and it is nice studying different ones to see how maybe you can blend them and try to find the one that most resonates with you. Personally, I think this is one that does make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't work for every plot. There's really no plot structure that does work for every single plot, but it is one that to me makes a good amount of sense. So I like to reference it. So that is all for this video. I hope that this was useful. Um, if you wanna use this structure in your own work, I definitely recommend it. It's one of my favorites and it's pretty easy to use and apply. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos from us. We've got new writing, editing, and publishing tips every Tuesday and Friday. Until next time.